Hello, I think we are live. Thank you all so much for joining us and thank you to Jonathan Ball Publishers for making today's webinar possible. Before we go any further, I just want to make sure Mark can hear me. We've been having some tech issues. Mark, everything all right your side? I can hear you loud and clear. Fantastic. So, Could you hear me sneeze? <laughs> I could. I think that's a good sign. So it's my great honor to be here today with Mark Professor, who I think one can say without any fear of exaggeration is one of the greatest narrative nonfiction writers ever produced by this country. Um, Mark is the author of now five books, um, most notably perhaps before the current publication, his magnificent biography of Thabo Mbeki, The Dream Deferred. And Mbeki, of course, makes for an extraordinarily complicated subject for any writer. So Mark is no stranger to complexity. But the book we're here to discuss today is, I think, arguably his most ambitious to date. It's called The Pink Line, Journeys Across the World's Queer Frontiers. I don't actually have a hard copy of it. Mark, do you have one there that you could you could show I, our audience? Oh, it's right I behind you. There's, there's one behind me, and he has another one in front of me. Fantastic. <laughs> it is nothing short of a global survey of the current status quo for LGBT people. But I also feel that describing it like that actually seems reductive because it's much more than that too. Mark has chosen these stunning interview subjects ranging from a gay couple in Tel Aviv, one of whom is an Arab Palestinian, the other an Israeli Jew, to one I particularly, the, the, the Jew I particularly loved, an American feminist scholar who finds herself incapable of understanding her own child's gender queerness. And through these subjects, Mark presents really rich portraits of queer lives internationally. And the world he shows us through them is deeply complicated. And that's something perhaps unfashionable in this world of Malcolm Gladwell's and instant connections and so forth. But it is a very complicated and nuanced subject. And I think it could only have been a, a mind like Mark's to do it justice. And Mark, perhaps this sounds terribly gauche and parochial, but when I read it, I felt so so very proud that it was a South African writer who had completed this task because it really is a magnificent achievement. And um, congratulations on the book and thank you so much for, for being with us today. Thanks, Rebecca. It's wonderful to be with you and thank you for those, for those wonderful words. Um, I, I kind of feel that it was um, my South Africanness and my, my history as a South African journalist that enabled me to write this book. Um, sort of going back to the very first time I dealt with this issue, which was when I co-edited a book called Defiant Desire with Edwin Cameron in, in the early 1990s, looking at gay and lesbian lives in South Africa. It's, it's a work I'm still very proud of. And um, what, what it got me to see very very early in my career, I was, I was in my mid twenties, was just how um, diverse and complex um, the what we call gay experience is, is that what, mm -hmm. what I call gay or what you call gay and the way we understand it um, is wildly different to the way um, Tiwonga Chimbalanga, uh, whom I write about, a, a, a transgender refugee from Malawi who lives just 20 kilometers away from me in on the Cape Flats outside Guguletu experiences it. And, and understanding this, the, how, how, how different um, uh, sexual identity and gender orientation, sexual orientation and gender identity mean to, to different people depending on on their culture, on their religion, on all of this stuff. Um, uh, forgive me, forgive me for that. Um, it re really opened me up to, to looking to looking at this globally, and to looking at how we um, we might all download, particularly in this era of 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 the digital revolution of globalization we might all download the same ideas of lgbt but the way we kind of live them and, and indigenize them the way these globalized ideas that that are transmitted from places like like cape town or new york or amsterdam or san francisco the way these are these are lived and experienced in places like cairo or or chennai or tel aviv um, or Uganda are wildly different, and I, and I wanted to understand that. 
And that's one of the fascinating points you make in your book, the extent to which our identities, which we love to feel in this kind of post-romantic era, are so ruggedly individual, are in fact entirely almost mm -hmm. contextually bound, that you and I would be very different people if we were living in any of the other places. Mark, I want to, as you'll be aware, we have questions coming in from our audience as we go, and there's one which perhaps we should address right off the bat, as in fact you do in your book, which is about terminology. Antoinette Wilde is asking yes. about the term queer, which you use the the queer yeah. frontiers, she says, when she was growing up, it was considered an offensive term. Can you just explain why you chose that particular label? Sure. And I, in fact, what I'm going to do is, is, if you don't mind, Rebecca, I'm going to read the first two paragraphs of, of my book because uh, this terminology issue is so important, so I want to get it mm. just right the way, the way I crafted it. So I begin my book with a note on terminology. I like the word queer because of its double valence as well as having been reappropriated by people across the word, world to describe themselves, queer means different or skewed. To see things from a queer perspective is to look at the world askance, to see it afresh. But frankly, it's also convenient. It's a catch-all that can hold well most of the L's, the B's, the G's and the T's and everyone else on the expanding alphabet. For this reason, however, it has sometimes lost its queer meaning particularly in the United States. If everyone is queer, no one is. I hope to get the balance right here. I go on to say that in some parts of the world, including South Africa, queer remains awkward because it's still so often used as a slur. It's also rejected by many transgender people who, like one of the people I write about, Liam, is emphatic that he's not queer, he's straight. Mm -hmm. So what I say before I embark on this journey is, is that even though I'm using the word queer, I, I make a point of calling the people in my book what they call themselves. And that's a sort of fundamental precept of my work um, in, in, in all my journalism, but, but, but in this book more than ever, because I'm dealing with people who, who, who attract so much, um, so much violence and opprobrium because of who they are. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the most important part I take is to acknowledge their own agency. Um, in the world, rather than to see them as 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 passive receptacles of whatever labels I or somebody else might put on them. Right. So, Mark, let's start. Thank you for that um, that clarification. Let's start with some of the broad strokes. I think before focusing in on some of the fascinating stories of your your interview subjects. Um, it's often said that the acceptance of homosexuality has been the quickest and most successful social shift uh, accomplished by the civil rights movement in human history. But definitely what your book makes clear is that this supposedly kind of linear progress is complex, it's partial, it's sometimes deceptive. And perhaps, you know, you and I can be seen as kind of living embodiments of the, the fruits of that progress. We're both openly gay professionals, we're both married to same-sex partners. I've recently adopted a child and I will be granted this, exactly the same legal rights as would a, a, a heterosexual parent. And that is, of course, not the case for, as you say, even auntie down the road, and we'll talk a bit about her, but around, uh, around the world also. So what can we say in a very broad and crude way about the current barometer for gay acceptance internationally? Firstly, congratulations on your child. It's, it's, Thank you so it's much. wonderful that you're a mom. <laughs> um, so I, 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 use the, I use the term the pink line in my book. And, and the notion of the pink line came to me, I, I remember exactly when, when I was trying to find a way of, of, of describing the consequences of, of a new global conversation that I believe has come to sort of define and describe the, and divide the world in a wholly new way. And I was looking at my timeline and I noticed that in the very same weeks that Britain passed an anti, a, a same-sex marriage act, Nigeria, passed an anti-same-sex marriage act, even though nobody in Nigeria was even asking for same-sex marriage. What mm -hmm. queer people they were asking for was, was the, the rights to privacy, to security, to dignity. What was going on here was is that um, uh, the issues of queer people, our issues, were sort of being weaponized in a geopolitical struggle as people in different parts of the world were, were laying claim to certain ideologies, pro-gay, anti-gay, to kind of um, prosecute perhaps other um, intentions. And, and the effect of that has been, has been very significant in, in the way it has 
brought a gay or transgender identity into the open in places where it was never spoken about before, like Uganda or Nigeria. Um, uh, but also how, as a result, there's been some sort of backlash against right. people who, who perhaps used to live on the down low, who, who, who kept their sexual orientation quiet, um, but who now, as a result of, of a new discourse that was, um, that was telling them that there are people in the world who, who are claiming these rights, that was saying, you, you, if you come out, you can um, have the right to choose your family, to, to not have to submit to the patriarchy if you're a woman and, and marry a man, that you can marry another woman, that you can have a kid. People were asserting these rights too in, in very hostile places. And thus the pink line was drawn, not only between countries, but within countries too. Um, because of course the, the people within Nigeria or within Uganda or within the United States who have very different opinions about this. Now, now a, along the way, what happens is that um, is that some people see a whole lot of rights that they didn't have accorded to them, such as your right to be in a same-sex marriage and have a child. And other people see rights actually being taken away from them that, that were there before. Um, in Hungary, for example, transgender people who, who won the right to change their, their gender legally have now had that right taken away from them because Viktor Orban, the Hungarian president, wants to make a point uh, that he is not going to allow his country to be dominated by the secular European perverse West. So you can see what happens to transgender people in that, in that consequence. All of which is to say there, there is really not one standard way that people experience um, their lesbian identity or their gay identity or their transgender identity, even once they take it on and believe that they, that they have a commonality with other people with those identities globally because of the, the realities, the exigencies of what happens offline. Because if there's a, if there's a pink line between countries and through countries, there's also a pink line between um, a kid with a smartphone and enough data and privacy to download ideas or community or, or solace. And, mm. and what happens when that kid looks up from their cell phone into the family where there's a stern disapproving parent or, or into the church where they're believed to be a demon or into the state where what they do is illegal. So this conflict that happens for the mm. first time in a way that there wasn't conflict in many societies before. Mm. Lovely comment here, Mark, from uh, Darren Sanders. Thanks for joining us, Darren. Halfway through the book, I have to say it's one of the most interesting books on this subject, many others that I've read in a long time. It reads like fiction, but is based in fact. Anecdotes and research reminds me that my gay queer journey is echoed in parts of the world that are so alien to me and yet now so familiar. That's a very good point, actually, Darren, which I'll come back to later, the kind of commonality as well as difference. And please do continue to leave your comments and questions for Mark, and we'll get to as many as, as we can. Mark, you, ha you ha have some fascinating insights into what makes countries more or less likely to legislate LGBT acceptance. I'm sorry, I'm putting you a bit on the spot there. But if you could... No, no, absolutely. That. I mean, what, one, there, there are many things. And we look at the world, the obvious one is, 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 is a, it, are countries that have um, liberal human rights traditions, uh, and when I say when I say liberal, I use it in the traditional word, uh, in the traditional sense of the word, where there's a where there's a respect entrenched into law for personal autonomy. Um, so countries where there has also been a, a women's rights movement and a gay rights movement before the new LGBT um, transgender rights movement too, are, are countries where where it's a logical next step. And obviously, I'm speaking here about Western Europe and 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 parts of the Anglo world. Um, in countries where there has been a, a long tradition of a collective women's movement, and in countries too where there's been powerful liberation theology, these are also countries which have been far more open. And I'm speaking here specifically about Latin America, which has become a sort of global leader in LGBT rights. And I'm also speaking about South Africa, where we sure. cannot ever underestimate the power of, of leaders like Bishop Tutu um, mm. in our history. Why is South Africa so different from other African countries where the church has been marshaled into a homophobic um, uh, ideology? The answer is the power of the liberation theology 
that that leaders like Bishop Tutu gave us, and specifically mm -hmm. Bishop Tutu's comment that after apartheid, uh, one of the world's greatest um, uh, problems was homophobia. I mean, you, you cannot underestimate the amount of that. Uh, another another way that another way to understand which countries have been able to make strides um, outside of the West is to look at the at, at the way. Well, let me take a step back. One of the, one of the one of the biggest difficulties for queer activists outside of the West is is that any support from the West gets to be seen as as a neo colonial. Right. depredation by the opponents and only just perpetuates this this toxic discourse so so a country like india for example has very that activists in india have very powerfully marshaled indian traditions to say yes when we speak about the need for gay rights or transgender rights of course we're referring to a global human rights discourse that's been developed in places like south africa and and the indian jurisprudence very 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 beautifully um echoes the South African jurisprudence, but we also have our own traditions and let's look at them. So we're, we're appealing to you as Indians, not just to look outwards to the world and to say, we want to be part of the global village and, and, and sign on to this notion of modernity that's inclusive. Also look at your own traditions, look at, look at the Vedic texts, look at the, um, look at the gender fluidity in in the Mahabharata and, and, and in temple Hindu iconography. Look at the writings of Nehru and Ambedkar, our own nationalist heroes, who speak about the importance of love marriages, who speak about the importance of respecting the other. Um, Botswana is another country in Africa that I think has done this really interestingly and has made progress, by, where, where activists have, 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 have been very successful in, 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 in helping others see that there are notions of acceptance of 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 of, of gender fluidity of concepts of, of of Ubuntu, even though it might not be called Ubuntu in Botswana, that, mm -hmm. that 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 are the roots of how one can one can not just tolerate but accept people who are different to yourself. Countries where 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 it has failed ha have been where where the debate has been externalized too much as that this is a Western imposition on our country. And yet there's fascinating sort of glitches in this model, aren't there? Because you write, for instance, some of the really interesting motives about why people in Ireland, famously conservative Ireland, voted yes in the same-sex mm -hmm. marriage referendum in 2015. One mm -hmm. reason posited is a kind of revenge against the Catholic Church, which had been so badly discredited by the pedophile priest scandal, and also simple pragmatism, mm -hmm. a kind of, oh, I actually do know a gay person who is, in fact, a decent mm -hmm. human. And then also mm -hmm. in Latin America, where you, you write that in certain cases, the gay rights movement has um, vaulted over the, the reproductive rights argument. So gay rights are enshrined no, before abortion, for instance. No, what's fascinating about, about Latin America is precisely that, that, um, that in, in most of the countries of Latin America, um, same-sex marriage is now legal. Mm -hmm. um, there are only two juris three jurisdictions in Latin America, and two are just cities, Mexico City and Buenos Aires, where um, abortion is legal. And it's a fascinating question as to why, in Catholic societies in particular, um, society's been able to tolerate gay rights, and, and or, 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 or let's not say society, let's say that, that, that the, the right wing, the religious political right wing, has been willing to roll over on gay rights, but not on abortion rights. Mm. And a lot of that has to do with, with the way activists have been able to frame gay rights as being about love and acceptance as family. Whereas um, as, as far as abortion is concerned, the other side still sees it as about death and killing. Mm. And, and it's, mm. so it's, a much, it's a much tougher obstacle to to climb. But the Ireland um, example is absolutely fascinating mm. because in Ireland it really worked for both um, gay rights and for abortion rights because soon after the Irish voted um, to allow same-sex marriage, they voted again uh, to change the constitution to allow abortion under certain conditions. And in both instances, and I think this is really important, Rebecca, in both instances it had to do with what the writer Colm Toibin said um, not just um, an, a, 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 an anger at the hypocrisy of the Catholic Church for, for, its, mm. uh, for the pedophilia that's tolerated in the church, but also 
Ireland being an intimate society where, where everybody knows somebody who's gay. And therefore, it's not abstract. It's your brother, it's your daughter, it's your parent, mm -hmm. it's your neighbor. And, and the campaign very specifically um, asked Irish people to think in that way. So right. parents were at the head of the campaign rather than mm -hmm. their queer kids. Similarly, having learned from the having learned from the same-sex marriage campaign, the Irish um, reproductive rights campaigners used exactly the same strategy. Right. So it was like, how many? They are. You, they might. They're, they're ashamed of it, so they might not talk about it. But you know somebody in your family who has had to endure the horror and the humiliation of having to leave the country to have an abortion mm. because they weren't able to have one here, even if their life depended on it. And that campaign was very successful in Ireland for, for a similar reason. And this notion of, so Ireland is an intimate society um, and, and that's perhaps why it worked there, but, but all societies are intimate. And, and the model of, um, of, of parents or family members advocating uh, for their queer children or brethren is, is a powerful one the world over. Absolutely. We've got quite a number of questions coming in, but some of them, I'm, uh, because they're focused on South Africa in particular, I'm going to leave till the end, just while we take a bit of a broader broader look now. Mark, just in terms of what you're saying about intimate societies, and it struck me that when dealing with your interview subjects, many of whom had experienced objectively horrific treatment at the hands of the state mm. or of their mm. communities, nonetheless, what seemed to be evident in almost all of them, I think, was that they were also the subject of unexpected pockets of support and tolerance from within their families, mm. from certain people, from their neighbors, mm. et cetera, from mm. auntie mm. in a Malawian village to Pasha even in, in Moscow. Mm. How did you mm. interpret that in terms of that apparent conflict? I think, I mean, I think as we've said that, um, well, societies are complex. I, I, I have yet in my travels and to do the research for this book, I, I went to 20 different countries over many years, even though I've, I honed in on, on nine in the end. I've yet to come across a society that I could call homophobic. Right. I've yet to come as, across a society that I could call sort of gay positive. Um, uh, this is such a, these are such complex issues. And, 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 they, and they really do cut to the heart of, of how we understand ourselves, how we understand families, how we understand our bodies, if you think about the new transgender debate. Um, there, there's, there's inevitably going to be um, complex and contradictory responses. You know, um, one of my stories is about a Ugandan kid called Michael, mm -hmm. who, who, who endures the most terrible depredations. He's thrown out of his home, age 15. He finds his way to Kampala, the capital of, 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 of Uganda. Um, somebody tells him about something called Facebook. He gets his hands on a smartphone. Uh, through Facebook, he finds older men who help him, but he also finds somebody who lures him into the, the most horrendous catfishing sting, which as it's called, um, extorting him, sexually assaulting him, filming him being sexually assaulted. Um, Michael, in the end, due to the trauma that he suffers from this, flees Uganda, has, has three really hellish years in, in the purgatory of, of refugee status in Kenya before landing up in Vancouver, where he is now. now. Now, what I have to say about Michael's story, to make the point we're talking about, is that when I spoke to Kenyans about Michael, they kind of rolled their eyes about all these Ugandans fleeing Uganda. Because if they'd visited Kampala, they call Kampala the San Francisco of East Africa. There's right. actually a really lively, thriving queer scene in Kampala where people, if they don't live openly, connect in public spaces the way they do in very few other African cities besides in South Africa. It's a complicated story in Uganda. There, mm. there are a lot of freedoms, but there's also a lot of backlash in Uganda. And Michael left Uganda, but many, 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 the most, the majority of Ugandan people, stay, Ugandan queer people, they call themselves Kuchus, stay in Uganda. Um, they are, they're subject to 
to a lot of discrimination and harassment, but they also claim their space. Now, similarly, Michael lands up in Vancouver, freedom, liberation, rest, <laughs> rainbow, and he has a terrible time. He has a really hard time. A lot of that has to do with being in exile in a strange place, being a kid, never having had parents, not knowing how to look, who looked after him, so not knowing how to look after himself. But he also finds himself subject to like horrible racism. Mm -hmm. he, he tries to find a church and 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 um, in the church he is he is attacked for being gay because it's a it's a black church um, where that that is homophobic as well. Not that all black churches are homophobic, but that's the one he found himself into. He experiences racism for the first time in Vancouver. Life is complicated um, for my subjects, for the people I write about, as it is for everyone, because society is complicated. I was struck by that actually. About there's a number, I think at least three or four of your subjects who end up receiving asylum in the West, which they've looked to for so long as this kind of utopia of freedom, and they get there only to find that actually in the hierarchy of the Western society they are nothing more than refugees. It is not as if their gay mm. status has granted them this kind of elevated posture. I'm thinking of an, the Egyptian pop star you wrote about who filled stadiums in Cairo yeah, and Hyman. ended up as a subway, yeah, yeah. subway busker, right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. there was something I mean, what, what I think should be said of, yeah, what, I should, what, should be, what should be said about someone like Ayman was, as you say, this pop star in, um, he was this pop star in, in Egypt. He had to, he came out. I mean, one of his most famous songs was a song which is a sort of the the an Arabic equivalent of I am what I am. And and right. which was kind of a little bit of a rain, a rainbow anthem in, in Egypt. Um, but it didn't, you know, it it, it was coded. Um, and 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 young people loved the song and loved him, not necessarily because they were gay, but because they identified with someone, particularly in the Arab Spring, sort of mm. experience articulating his his difference and his freedom to be himself. And and then during the course of the Arab Spring, when people in Egypt felt like, oh my God, the world is changing, you know, we're 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 finally able to be ourselves on the street, we can be free. Ayman, like so many young Egyptians, came out publicly online. Uh, then a couple of years later, when when um, Al Sisi, General Al Sisi, did his coup d'état, he sort of he and 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 stamped out this blossoming. Um, civil society as a way of, sh the way he showed that he was now this new, um, this new force bringing order and control. One of the ways he showed that he was this new force bringing order and control to the society that was spiraling out of control um, in the Arab Spring was as he clamped down on LGBTQ people, on queer people. Mm. And, and many of those who had come out of the closet uh, were forced to go into exile, including Ayman. And, and and for them in particular, for, for Ayman in, in 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 Egypt, who's now, as you say, a subway busker, or for Maha and Amira in, in the Netherlands, who were these this amazing lesbian yeah. couple who who opened a sort of openly queer sidewalk shisha bar in downtown Cairo, where I used to hang out with the whole of queer Cairo. I mean, they're devastated at having had to leave Cairo. Um, because they love the city so much. And, and that dislocation is, is really powerful. Now, now, in the case of Maha, what makes it even more difficult is, is he, okay, so she goes to this place, the Netherlands, where she's given, she's given um, status because she's a, a lesbian. She's told, you know, we accept and love and tolerate uh, lesbian people, so welcome. But she's also a Muslim woman. Right. And, um, and not only, is Dutch society sometimes passively, sometimes aggressively anti-Muslim. But there are Dutch politicians like Geert Wilders who use LGBT rights to, to otherize Muslims. Because what mm -hmm. they say is, they say is Muslims are homophobic. Therefore, they are against Dutch culture. They are against European culture. Therefore, we have to keep them out. So an anti-immigrant agenda in Western Europe, in places like the Netherlands, in Belgium, in Germany, in France, an anti-immigrant agenda is tied to a pro-gay, anti-Muslim agenda. Where does that leave someone like Maha? I mean, how does she be her, how does she live her, her Muslim self and her lesbian self right. in a society that, that celebrates her for one, that kind of demonizes her for the other? It's fascinating. Many of the strands you talk about there in terms of 
what is sometimes called pinkwashing, the use of at least kind of surface acceptance of gay rights as a way of uh, providing this kind of veneer of human rights when actually there are many other more violent sentiments under the surface are of course illustrated by Israel. And to which you, sure. you, you, I mean, I think you write that of all your travels that you felt, you felt the most kind of discomforted in, in Tel Aviv in your time there. Mm. But that is, of course, Israel, of course, this country which ostensibly offers the only truly safe harbor for gays in the Middle East while perpetrating acts of oppression and violence against Palestinians. And you meet this couple there. One is an Israeli Jew, one is an Arab Palestinian. And there's much we could talk about there. But Mark, I wanted to bring up one thing which I found fascinating is you, you quote a queer Palestinian woman you call Zainab in Ramallah, mm, mm, mm. who says mm. that contrary to you know the propaganda, much of which is put out by Israel, queer Palestinians are not necessarily repressed. She says it's about priorities. We are an occupied people fighting for our freedom. That struck me so much, and I'm not sure if the, Edwin Cameron brought this up when you were discussing him last week, so reminiscent of what the ANC stalwart R Ruth Monparty said when questioned about gay rights towards the end of the apartheid era, who said, you know, let's worry about gay rights later. We're, we're, we're fighting for black people's rights and everything else has to be secondary. There's a fascinating notion of the kind of hierarchy of rights to be fought for, isn't there? So, I, so yes, absolutely. But I want to I want to stick with that for a while. I think it's really interesting, Rebecca, because the difference between Ruth Monparty and Zainab mm -hmm. is that Ruth Monparty is was not does not ex, did not experience herself um, any kind of discrimination or oppression on on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. Right. Sure. Um, whereas Zainab Zainab is a lesbian woman, mm -hmm. and and in a way, and this is the this is this really talks to the agency point. So you're absolutely right about about the way these things get hierarchized, and mm -hmm. we could critique Zainab for hierarchizing in that way, but but we also need to listen to Zainab because Zain, it's Zainab's own struggle, whereas whereas the struggle for for recognition as a lesbian or as a transgender person was not Ruth Monparty's struggle, right? right? Um, and I think that that's an important point to be made. Uh, that being said, um, you know at the same time. That Ruth Monparty said that Tabon Becky in one of in one of his greatest moments, well, not in the same time in response to Ruth Monparty saying that Tabon Becky in one of his greatest moments counted counted her and said, No, well, actually, if we if we believe that human rights are indivisible, uh, we really have to understand that that the rights of gay people are rights too. That's what Tabon Becky said in the late 1980s, which was you know amazingly progressive. And similarly, there are Palestinians. Um, who who are willing to say as much, but but fewer perhaps than okay. than South Africans who are willing to say as much in the apartheid era. Why is that? Uh, I mean, I can think of several reasons. Yeah. Uh, the the most the two most powerful are ha have to do with the way the world is different now. How there is a strong Islamist anti-gay right wing now, in a way that as there is a strong uh, Christian fundamentalist anti-gay right wing in a way that there wasn't in the 1980s, either of those things, because it's a backlash to rights that have been claimed. But more importantly, in the Palestinian example, and this talks to your to your pinkwashing comment, is, is that Ruth Monparty um, was not, and Tabo Mbeki, were not fighting a foe that was using gay rights against them. Mm. The apartheid mm. government wasn't that into gay rights either. No. Right. Well, no, no, no. In fact, um, Defiant Desire, the book that I edited with Edwin, sort of shows the way uh, that that the apartheid government boxed people according to sexual orientation as well as according to race. What's happening in Israel is is that Israel uses gay rights against the Palestinians. Israel says, "What makes us different and better to you? What makes us the goodies and you the baddies?" Is, is that we love our gay people and you hate your gay people. More than that, one of the things that Israel does is when Israel, and I write about somebody like this, when Israel finds a gay Palestinian that it can use, Israel will turn that gay Palestinian against his or her own people by threatening to out them to their own communities. And I write about somebody, this is documented, Rebecca. Mm. I, I, I write about somebody in my book um, a man who I call Nabil, who had this experience. So when gay rights is used against you in that way, 
you come to see it as a, as a tool in the hands of the enemy. And that, that creates in your society a certain kind of backlash against gay rights. I, I, I cite as well in the book uh, an, an amazing, uh, really pioneering Palestinian queer rights activist who says that she, her friends in Ramallah are, are not happy to walk down the street with her because the fact that she's openly lesbian makes it seem to them or to their, to their community that she must be a sellout. So, mm -hmm. so this is exactly how pink line politics has been activated. And this is not in any way to excuse Palestinian mm -hmm. homophobia or to excuse um, the way Palestinian queer people have really been, in some instances, violated uh, mm -hmm. by, by, by religious nationalists. But it's to kind of explain it and put it into context. So speaking of religious nationalism, quite a few of our uh, viewers wanting to know more from you about charismatic churches and homophobia in Africa, the way that the mm. evangelical movement has harnessed um, and kind of mm. actively fermented homophobia in places like Uganda and Kenya. Andrew mm. True and Wayne Daniels both asking about that. And you seem to indicate that that's mm. a relatively recent phenomenon. Absolutely. I mean, they're, 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 you could say that there have been two waves of of Christian homophobia that have that have swept across Africa. The first was was the Victorian one of, of the nineteenth century, with, which brought with it these notions of, of 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 sin and of certain sexual practices being sinful and writing them into the law in a way that they weren't written into the law in, in, in traditional African societies. Not to say that traditional African societies were like these wonderful polyamorous pansexual kind of you know paradises where anybody could do what they want no i mean there's there've always been stig there's always been a, there's always been stigma against non-conforming non-normative people but the notion of of the sexual act of sodomy being against the order of nature is something that that the colonial order brought so it's it's, it's an immense irony that this that this law now still on the books in so many African and Caribbean and Asian countries is 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 used against the the un-African practice of homosexuality. So that was the first wave. The second wave is is as your as 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 your question is state this this wave of right wing Christian evangelism, and we've got to put this into the context of what was happening, what's been happening in America, in the United States in the last couple of decades, which is is that. Um, that battle has been lost. There is same-sex marriage. Uh, we nearly, we nearly had uh, a gay Democratic presidential candidate, Pete mm. Buttigieg. Um, the, you can't sting with the anti-gay um, culture wars tactic anymore. So, so in a way, um, the religious right wing needed to sort of look for new pastures, new souls to save. And you know how wonderful um, here is a whole continent um, where evangelical Christianity is really taking root. Now, why is evangelical Christianity taking root so powerfully in Africa? There are many reasons. One reason has to do with the failed state and with the fact that the state doesn't provide to citizens. And evangelical Christianity, like Islamic fundamentalism, Hamas in the case of Israel, um, provides like a full spectrum of social services. Mm -hmm. uh, to people who go to church. Right. It's very powerful in that way. Um, it's also a place of joy uh, where, there's, where there's a lot of pain and hardship in life. So people are flocking to these churches and these churches are gaining more and more power in their society. And, and what these churches were able, adopted from the West was a sort of a, a, a Christian right-wing playbook which says that if you can, if you use this issue, you can have political power too, and 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 there really were um, very very prominent pastors from um, the United States. It's documented who brought this notion of an of new anti-gay legislation to Uganda, to Nigeria, to Kenya. But I think what's really important to note, and 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 I make this point in my book, is is that just because the second wave of Christian homophobia has a, a particular script that was developed in the United States. 
doesn't mean it's it's just a Western export. Um, to say that African homophobes have been contaminated by the West is pulling the same movers to say right. that African homosexuals have been contaminated by the West. Uh, we are all Africans, whether we have skin, your color, or the color of other people on this webinar. Uh, we are global citizens. We download ideas that suit us, that work for us. We internalize them. We indigenize them, and we act on them. And 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 so I I would I would urge us to look at both um, LGBT rights and um, the and the Christian anti LGBT phenomenon as 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 African energies that are played out on Africa that connect to to global discourses. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, Mark, because I understand the temptation to make the case that homophobia is an un-African import. I mean, I think I've done it myself, possibly. But as you say, it is merely playing on the same drum. Mark, we're running out of time, and I desperately want us to discuss um, a topic which takes up quite a bit of the latter portion of your book, which is the transgender culture wars. I mean, there's a sense in which, you know, the fight for gay rights looked as if it was being won in many parts of the world, and then this kind of new ideological bomb exploded, and as many people, uh, at least one person has pointed out, it's not in fact new, but it came to prominence. And that was the issue of transgender politics. And I mentioned in the introduction how much I loved your choice as a subject of Elizabeth, who's this American, very right on woke feminist scholar who totally understands gender as a construct. This is probably the foundation of her own scholarship and now has child herself who identifies as genderqueer and wants to throw that book kind of out the window and how deeply destabilizing that is for Elizabeth and frankly for many of us, particularly feminists who have, you know, become kind of wedded to this idea. Gender is a social construct. There's no such thing as a male, male mind or a female mind. And transgender discourse is asking us to rethink those concepts in really destabilizing ways. Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's, it's, it is, um, it's where my book goes and it's where the journey has been most interesting and challenging for me too. And, and I think it's something we really need to come to grips with and, 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 and understand. Um, you know, I, I write about how, um, and, I, and I, was, I discussed the implications of this for the Christian right wing, how in the West the dial has moved from the L and the G across to the T. Not to say that there haven't always been gender fluid or transgender people, even though they might not have used the word transgender, but as you say, the politics of it is new. And, and what happened is, is, is that because of a whole lot of things, because of the successes of the gay rights movement, because of huge advances in biomedical technology that have made um, medical transition, whether it's surgery or, or, or hormones, endocrinology, um, so much more accessible and so much more effective because of that because of other ways that society is changing because of the way as one of my um one of my american informants puts it uh the culture is moving from notions of illness to wellness mm. um the culture is moving from saying oh my god there's something wrong with me how can i fix it to um i will be my true self and I will find a way of being the better self. So, mm. so, so along that trajectory, um, uh, transgender people and and the people who look after them in the medical in the medical world have stopped even using terms like gender dysphoria right. uh, or gender disorder, and now speak about gender incongruence. That's actually the term that's been adopted by the World Health Organization. So, I am no longer dysphoric. I am incongruent because the gender I feel is incongruous with the way people see me. Mm. Um, that's changed. And another thing that's changed in the world is, 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 is the rights of children and the way children are, are no longer seen but not heard. The, the way we listen to children and the way um, children are perceived of, of having rights to say who they are and what they want and what they need. And, and as one person in my book says to me, an advocate for transgender children, if we're going to say we listen to, we, we want to listen to children, we have to hear what they have to say. All of this, all of these dynamics have shifted the culture in the West it, it, to, to a place that, that transgender rights 
are now embraced um, mm. and accepted in many ways. But at the same time, there's been a really powerful backlash. Mm. And there's been a backlash from the, from the Christian right wing who have needed um, a new battle to fight, a new way to wage the culture wars. So now this culture wars is waged, you know, I think quite preposterously around children's bathrooms and whether children right. have the right to go to the bathroom of the gender, of their felt gender. And there are huge battles that rage in America that, that in, in courts and in, in, in school districts around this very issue. And I, and I write about that in my book. So that's one, one place of, 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 of backlash or resistance. But another more troubling place of backlash and resistance comes from um, a, a feminist and often lesbian feminist position um, that has its roots in, 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 in the feminism of, of the 1970s. And that, that, I mean, I'm not going to go into the depths of it now, but that says that basically um, womanhood is something biological and it's the biological condition of womanhood that is at the root of gender oppression and that not only can transgender women not be accepted as women because they have a penis or they had a penis, but that they actually pose a threat to other women and to children in bathrooms, in women-only spaces, on sports fields, where because of their, their male or formerly male bodies, they're going to be able to compete better than women. They're going to win competitions. And even our own Custa Semenya, who's definitely not transgender, has been used in that way by the anti-transgender lobby because her competition is unfair because of the amount of testosterone she has. So it's hugely complicated. And you can imagine how complicated it is for transgender people themselves who are caught in these culture wars and are just trying to be themselves and live their lives with, with dignity and with security. Um, it's hugely complicated for parents who are now faced with all these options for their children that aren't there before. What do you do when your child says, I no longer want you to call me Rebecca, I now want you to call me Sean. I no longer want you to use she when talking about me. I want you to use they. I mean, that's one step. But what do you do when your child says, I am, even though I look like a boy, I'm a girl, and I want to start taking drugs so that my exterior coheres with how I feel internally. How do you deal with that as a parent? These are incredibly complicated issues. And, 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 and the families that are dealing with these issues now, and I write, issues now, and I write about these families in the United States because I believe this is the new pink line. I mean, I really think they are at the sort of cutting edge of, of, of a new human rights frontier. And, and, and some people um, call the children who are trans, the young people who are transitioning, some people sort of celebrate them as pioneers. Other people are horrified at the way they're being used as guinea pigs mm. by, by, by ideologists and, and medical scientists. Um, you know, I, I, I don't see them as guinea pigs because, because, because I do see the way that the people who look after them in most instances take great care to make sure that the right decisions are being made. But I do acknowledge that they are they're taking our culture into new territory. And um, that's really scary. Um, and who knows how it's going to turn out? I mean, who knows how anything's going to turn out? <laughs> we, yeah, we might I, say in, in the pandemic, given global warming, whatever. But who knows how it's going to turn out for this, for this first generation of really brave young people who I write about, who are you know, the first or only the second generation to transition in this way. But, but, it, but we have to acknowledge that, that our society is changing and what the effects of this are. And it's not just transgender issues, right? You you write about the this youth group in the, the states, the riot. What are they called? Riot kids. Riot you know, youth. Riot. Riot youth. Yeah, who have these incredibly kind of, I mean, to old fogies like us, arcane notions of gender. One one of your um, interlocutors tells you they believe that there are seven billion types of gender, as many for uh, every person on the planet has their own subjective concept has of their own gender. gender. And there's a sense in which that they, they feel that people like, well, I'll say me, because I'm not even sure about you anymore, John, Mark, after your um, afterward <laughs> book. But after my revelation do, at the end of my book. <laughs> that's right. But people like me who do identify as, you know, a cisgendered 
woman person are hopelessly mm. old fashioned and you know just trapped by these rigid gender binaries that, that, that they're going to be getting rid of. It is fascinating, as you say, and it does come with a bunch of questions that are troubling. But I think you're right too in saying that the, the argument about toilets, for instance, has obviously been just, I mean, it is on the face of it ridiculous, but there's been this real overreaction to these tiny points, which have been quite consciously fomented by, for instance, the British right-wing tabloids, etc. Because I thought one of the, the key points that you make in your book, quoting someone else, is that the vast majority of trans youth still receive no help, no care. There's nobody looking out for them, taking them for hormone blockers, et cetera. And perhaps that should be where our real concern is focused. Yeah, yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, a few more questions coming through, Mark. Um, Atish, this is one I don't envy you. Cameron's sister asking, what's your <laughs> thoughts on the future of identity politics? I mean, that's kind of what we're talking about, considering how fluid gender and sexual identity is. Well, let me just kind of jump on that a little bit. When you were interviewing these young radical people in America, did you get the sense that, because you speak also about how the, these identities are so contingent based on their political environments, their peers, etc. cetera. Contest, sure, yeah. yeah. Right. Did you get the sense that this was something they were likely to this sounds patronizing, I don't mean it like that, to grow out of, or was were these really kind of fixed identities taking shape? You know, um, when I went, as the old fogey that I am, when I went to university in America, there were people who we called LBGs, lesbians before graduation. Right. <laughs> um, people who were using their, their youthful time to, to sort of expand their consciousness and their ideas. And, and you can kind of be scathing of them, or you can say, wow, how great. Mm. That, you know, some LBGs did kind of find a guy, get married, become heteronormative, have children. And other LBGs were, were LPGs like you. Post-graduation, <laughs> they, they just stayed in that. Right. <laughs> in, in that identity. Now there's a similar category that that my that my amazing young people in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is where I did my research, gave me, which is trans trenders. Mm. Not trans trenders transgenders but transgenders and they define transgenders as people who were like signing on to this new identity or this new stuff because it was trendy or cool because gender was the new cutting edge because this is the way i mean that their generation was defining themselves against their parents mm. all of that sort of stuff and you know they were going to grow out of it too and um and yes there there are a component of, of people who will um move into some other space now, where this is um, terrifying, if you're a parent or if you are a, um, if you sign on to the, to the, I would say the anti-transgender ideology of some feminists as well, is is like, LBGs didn't change their bodies, whereas um, transgenders, transgenders might change their bodies. Mm. What then, if they decide to change their minds later on in life, mm. you know? It's a fair point, which is why um, uh, some parents insist that their kids wait until they're 18 before they embark on medical transition. Mm. But that's very complicated because the earlier you start medical transition, the more successful in the way you're going to be seen by others you're going to be. And the less you're going to have to deal with the gender dysphoria of adolescence, which is where the trouble so often happens. So it's a, it's th these are very tough questions, uh, and and I don't have the answers to them. I will say that that one of the people I follow in my book is an amazing young woman called Rose, and 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 Rose transitioned to masculinity, and then um, retransitioned back to femininity, mm -hmm. and now lives as a very butch lesbian woman with a deep voice because of the testosterone and some facial hair. And and people like Rose are held up by the anti-trans movement to say, look, see, this is why it's dangerous, because they're going to be regretters. That's actually mm. the the, the mm. clinical term. They're going to be detransitioners. That's going to be another. That's another clinical term. And they are going to they're going to regret and they're going to blame us for having pushed them into this too quickly. And and inevitably there are some regretters who have stood up to be counted and have said, you know, that they really wish that they'd had a gender counselor who, who 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 led them through more hoops or the, or that they're angry that they that they transitioned 
There's not very many of those people. The data doesn't show many of those people. And Rose, the person who I met, and I didn't go out and seek her. It just so happened the story that unfolded in front of me as I followed these people after seven years. Rose is not a regretter, and she hates that term. Yeah. Rose is a, is a non-binary person who, who, is, who was once more, more feminine, is now more, well, then more masculine, is now more feminine, but sees. Rose said to me, I've never fit into boxes. And um, frankly, if I was born in, in a boy's body, I would have probably had to transition to girl and then come back again. And this is something that these, young, that these kids are teaching us. So, so something that's very threatening to, to the binarist opponents of transgender identity is, is that a lot of kids who now go for gender care only want partial transition. They only want a transition, say for example, that stops them from menstruating, but that they want to keep their breasts. And they want to place themselves somewhere on the gender spectrum um, rather than just going all the way over from male to female and place themselves on the, somewhere on the gender spectrum that, 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 that suits the way they feel inside. Now, opponents to this say, um, this is just kind of bratty millennial or Generation Z behavior mm. of kids who just think they can have it all. Um, another perspective is to say that um, the culture is finding ways of moving the binary onto a spectrum and onto a spectrum that has existed in many non-Western societies before colonialism anyway. And another key part of my book that we haven't got around to talking, and I know we have to end, is what has been the effect of this kind of non-binary identity, or no, let's say this Western transgender identity, on societies where there has been a more fluid notion of gender. And, and I spend the last part of my book looking at that too, because my book's about the world, not just about the West. Let us bring Sorry, it back. So much. Not at all, Mark, but just before we leave, I want to bring it back to South Africa, because we've had quite a few people asking the same question in different forms. And that is, as we've all commented, the gulf between our queer friendly constitution and the lived reality. Any kind of Words of wisdom advice for you to policymakers, to ordinary citizens, etc., in terms of how we continue to drive social progress in South Africa in terms of LGBT rights. I mean, there are a few things to say about this, Rebecca. The first is, is that um, there is always an uneasy dance between legal reform and social change. And we know that in South Africa better than, than almost anywhere in the world, not just around LGBT rights, but around a whole lot of rights about the rights to housing, the rights to education, et cetera. And, um, and, and really what it comes down to is, is a number of things. The first is, is insisting that policy is implemented um, that takes into account the law. And where that policy is not implemented, uh, finding ways of litigating for that policy to be implemented in pathways. The second way is acknowledging that um, uh, there is a gap in society, and this has been measured through really important data conducted for the other foundation in South Africa um, between uh, what people think. Okay, let, let me put this into, to, in, in, into numbers. Um, this research showed that, that, the, that the vast majority of South Africans believe that, that LGBT people had rights and that these rights should be respected. But that only a very tiny majority of South Africans, 51 or so percent, um, believed that homosexuality was acceptable. Mm. And so there's this gap between what we feel in our hearts and what we accept as rights. Mm. And we've got, to, we've, got to, we've got to close that gap. We've got to close that gap. And the way we close that gap is, is through advocacy, but through through targeted, um, uh, meaningful advocacy, such as what we were talking about, working with parents, working mm -hmm. with communities, working in churches, but also accepting that there is going to be backlash. Yeah. And, 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 and understanding that so much, I think this is really critical, understanding that, that so much of what we see of what is called, for example, punitive rape in the townships, this terrible violence that's perpetrated on gender non-conforming lesbians, trans and transgender women and, and, and queer men 
is, is as a result of the space that these young people have claimed, that in previous generations, they didn't claim. And by claiming the space, they are challenging sort of age old norms the, the, and, 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 and power systems, um, systems, systems that put men always together with women, systems that say who has the right to earn money and who needs to stay home and look after kids, the systems of patriarchy. And inevitably, there's going to be backlash when that space is claimed. And that's one of the things we, we've experienced in South Africa. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you to all of you who joined us from home. Mark's book is called The Pink Line, Journeys Across the World's Queer Frontiers. I've read it twice. It is truly a breathtaking accomplishment, both for its scale, the scholarliness of its research, and for the beautiful compassion that Mark brings, as always, to his writing about real people. Mark, thank you so much, and good luck with the book. Thank you so much for having me, Rebecca. It really was a, a pleasure being with you and being hosted by my favorite media platform, uh, Daily Maverick. It's wonderful to be on here. Thanks and goodbye.